So we now have two self-consciousnesses, or recognizant self-consciousness. In brief, one, each one wants to be recognized, but does not want to recognize the other. Two, thus a fight to the death ensues. Three, also important, each self knows that it is not just a natural thing or body, but also a free subject. And so it is willing to risk its life to show it is free and more than its body, more than an object. So in the end, one combatant prefers life to death and becomes a slave of the other, who becomes his master. However, it is the slave who progresses and realizes his freedom and independence by working on and fashioning things, not destroying them, to suit not himself, but the master. And thus he overcomes desire and selfish egotism. As Hegel says on page 161, Quote, the slave then rises above the selfish individuality of his natural will and thus stands higher as regards his worth than the master who, caught up in his egotism, beholds in the slave only his immediate will and is recognized by an unfree consciousness. This subjugation of the slave's egotism forms the beginning of true human freedom. This quaking of the individuality of the will, the feeling of the nothingness of the ego, the habit of obedience, is a necessary moment in the education of every man and woman. Without having experienced the discipline that breaks self-will, no one becomes free and rational. The master then realizes that he can only get true recognition, not from a dependent slave, but only from a free and independent person, an equal. So the upshot is the mutual recognition of both self-consciousnesses, which results in universal self-consciousness. In universal self-consciousness, we have the required unity of opposites or identity in difference, which is the concept and the truth. Quote, I recognize you as absolutely free and independent, and I recognize you as recognizing me as absolutely free and independent." End quote. We are absolutely the same, yet absolutely different and independent. You are my mirror in which I see myself, and I am your mirror in which you see yourself. Hence, the I is now universal. The truth is realized, as Hegel says, quote, in relating myself to the other, I immediately relate to my own self. And here we have the tremendous division of mind or spirit into different selves, which are both completely free independent, absolutely resistant, and yet at the same time identical with one another, hence not self-subsistent, not impenetrable, but as it were, merged together. So, I overreach you. I am in you as well as in me. I am universal or all, and so are you. 
This is precisely the unity of consciousness and self-consciousness. What is important is that when self-consciousness has attained universality, it has given up its particularity as a separate personality or ego, and thus ceases to be self-consciousness. Self-consciousness has become reason. Reason, or the idea, is the unity of the concept, subjectivity, and objectivity, which came to light in universal self-consciousness. As Hegel says, quote, in its absolute difference from its other, it is yet absolutely identical with its other. Thus reason, as universal or all, includes within itself both the subject and the object. Reason is all-encompassing. Quote, the universality of reason means that the object which in consciousness was only given is now universal and encompasses the I. It also means that the pure I, the self, now overarches the object and encompasses it within itself." End quote. Thus, self-consciousness or reason is the certainty that its determinations are objective as much as they are its own thoughts. Reason, as the unity of subject and object, is therefore the truth. Indeed, reason is the I as infinite universality. And finally, reason, as the truth aware of itself, as the self-knowing truth, is precisely spirit or mind. Spirit is then the truth, the whole of what is aware of itself. To underscore and illuminate the point we have now reached, let us sum up subjective spirit by the UPI concept. We began with anthropology, you, the soul, which was a single whole prior to subject-object separation, with nothing outside of it. In phenomenology, P, consciousness, the whole broke up into two parts with a subject-object separation. When we advance to psychology, I, spirit or mind, we have returned to the single whole of anthropology. However, now the whole contains the object or objectivity, i.e. the objective world, universe, within itself, and not, as in phenomenology, outside itself. Also remember that absolute science is the science of the absolute of the one reality, which includes everything within itself. And remember, quote, the absolute is spirit. As Hegel says, quote, free spirit or mind, the subject of psychology, is just reason dividing itself into infinite knowledge and the object identical with this knowledge. That is, the knowledge has only itself as content, meaning that it embraces within itself all objectivity, the whole universe. We will take all of this up next time in our study of C-Psychology. Thank you.